Hello, you guys. I hope you're all doing well. Happy Friday. So I'm gonna wait for a few of you guys to get here. We're just gonna have some water. I have so much to tell you. We are going to, I thought I would share some thoughts, some just like thoughts for the week as a teacher. Sometimes I see some themes pop up for everybody and it's so funny um, how we're all, hello Michael, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> um, so yes, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the themes from lessons this week. And Sylvia, yay! And I'm going to play you some tunes on my harp here that I've been noodling through. Maybe play you something on the viola. And um, I also wanted to share with you this fabulous book that I am reading. I'm reading like, I have a pile of books <laughs> by the bed and I have, I'm like surrounded by books here at the moment as well. So are any of you out there bookworms as well? It's just so nice to be surrounded by books. So I was sitting um, this morning and I was just kind of trying to figure out, I was taking some notes. <laughs> I was trying to keep everything straight. So um, are you gonna go grocery shopping, Sylvia? Is that what you said? Just be careful, you know. Um, one little tip, my other half is a scientist and he said that if you wear a face mask, put it, like wash your hands, put your face mask on, and then don't touch your face mask or your face at all for the entire time that you're out. And then when you come back, you're gonna wash your hands, take off the face mask and throw it away. And then you wash your hands, right? So just make sure that you're not touching your face when you have your face mask on. And just, you know, when you take it off, just take it off and put it in the trash because they're really not meant to be recycled. So um, I think that's one thing that our country has not told us how to do. They're just saying like, wear a face mask, but then they're not saying, this is how you should wear a face mask. <laughs> so even if you just wear a bandana, just put that bandana right in the, um, you know, put it in the laundry machine and wash it right away. So even when we're out in the world and you have a face mask on, just don't be touching your face. Um, if you're wearing a bandana, don't be touching your face, just put it on and then you're done. So anyway, are you guys doing okay? I had a, I actually had a little mental health moment this morning. I had to just sit down and just like, you know, have a little, <laughs> have a little moment. It's easy to get overwhelmed, you know, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. And I think one of the things that I was noticing in lessons this week, and I mean, it's, it's tricky because when you're in a music lesson or when you're doing anything, uh, it's easy. And this is actually what I was saying earlier for any of you that are new. I, for the studio, for all the people that I'm lucky enough to work with and teach for whatever reason we all seem to be a little bit in tune <laughs> we are like in tune together so that's um certain there'll be like you know five people in the studio that have this that they have this kind of theme and then there's five people in the studio that might have like this kind of theme come up and we're all just kind of you know either it's like the bow hand or it's the form or it's the like try it's like a mental thing where we have to try and like stay focused or something and I mean, so it's all usually all of those kinds of things at once um, for the rest of us, you know, because we're just doing so many things. But I was just thinking that, um, and in previous videos, I've really, um, hi, I'm so happy to see you, Reese. Thank you for being here. In previous videos, I think we've talked a little bit about um, the idea of harmony. And I'm sitting next to a music theory textbook here, and I was trying to find the definition of harmony. <laughs> And um, I think the definition of harmony just is this entire book. But because I, you know, when we use the word harmony, of course, it, it can mean like um, everything is, everything is like in tune, right? Whether it's like your actions and your thoughts and your words and everything is in tune together and you're existing harmoniously in your life or um, whether it's like you're just expressing harmony on an instrument by just playing things that sound beautiful together. When you tune, for example, and you're tuning and you're creating harmony um, versus just playing completely out of tune. But I also feel like there's another level of harmony and that's harmony encompassing both the dark and the light. I mean, we see that in scales when we're practicing 
a major scale versus a minor scale. They're on that same little key signature spectrum of whatever, how many sharps or however many flats, but on one side you have the light aspect and then on the other side you have the darker aspect of that. That's just one, you know, example of music encompassing both light and darkness, for example. Um, and then you can see that in a chord progression as well. Like in a chord progression, it is an example of harmony, but you're gonna be progressing through time and you're gonna encounter, you know, beautiful chords and then you're gonna encounter like dissonant chords and then eventually they're gonna like get, you know, much more, uh, more tension is going to build and maybe perhaps more dissonance and then it finally when it resolves, it's so beautiful. So it's almost like that, that little light in the darkness where the harmony is like on this path, right? Um, and sometimes it like goes away from the from the path, and but then it comes back to the path again, if that makes any sense. But it's always kind of focused on resolving back to its one chord, for example, um, for whatever key that we're in. And it can like explore the, the terrain of like, I'm gonna go over here into this forest, but I'm gonna go over here into this swamp, and then, oh, this is really beautiful over here, and I'm gonna stay here, and then, oh, now I'm back home again. And, um, I guess this whole, this whole thing just reminded me of the fact that we ourselves are also instruments. We are um, dealing with so much within ourselves and without in our lives and we can actually use whatever opportunity, wherever we are, whatever circumstance we're in in life to try to keep that little kernel of harmony you could think of it um, or you could think of it as just like your own inner peace you know just kind of hold on to that little glimmer of that despite the turmoil that's outside in the world or even in your home <laughs> and i think one of the ways that we kind of conquer that a discord is by actually looking at it and just realizing okay my room's messy and it looks really discordant and I'm gonna just go clean. <laughs> I'm gonna go clean this area. I'm gonna organize this area. I'm gonna do the laundry. I'm gonna wash my clothes. I'm gonna dust this and then, and now everything's clean and now I'm gonna fill it with things that are beautiful, right? And so I guess I just wanted to, to just remind you of, of all that stuff that you already probably know that um, you're an instrument interacting in your world as well. and. I think that we can, in our own ways, because we're all, we're all individual people, we have our own way of expressing our own sense of peace and harmony, you know, around others or within ourselves. So you're doing your clothes, <laughs> perfect. So you're creating, you're creating beauty, right? And I think it's so important to just fill your, keep your space clean, because that's your outer representation of your potential inner world, you know? Sometimes it's nice to have things chaotic as well, but um, like you'll, if you look around, I try to keep like beautiful, fun things. And you've seen this photo before. This is a picture of Sedona that I got from its eclectic image um, art galleries, eclectic image art galleries in Sedona. And it's just been like so wonderful to have this beautiful picture there. I have a, a broomstick left over from Halloween. I just thought it was so fun to have in the corner and then the salt lamp. And I have this little rock that says today's gonna be a good day, you know? And it, you can't see it here, but you know, there's like beautiful crystals everywhere. <laughs> Cause I love, I just love um, the beauty of crystals. And uh, yeah, so just maybe if you feel inspired today, just, See if there's a way that you can beautify your space if you're feeling like, you know, turmoil inside. Just um, clean up your own area and fill it with beautiful things and that's one way to experience harmony on the outside and it might help you on the inside as well. And then of course, you can pick up your instrument and try and express harmony <laughs> on this thing too. And um, even if you can't express much on the instrument you could just try to play with a just play a sound you know i remember there was one time there's so been so many times where i've gotten just so frustrated at like just wanting to play this thing and then just for whatever reason i just can't like play it the way that i want to 
it's just the life of playing this instrument, you know? And so you just have to just settle down and just, just play like one note. So just find a sound that you like the sound of. So for example, let's see. What sounds good to me? I'll play an A flat. And just kind of whatever comes out. Even if there's like a wrinkle in the string or it's not sounding quite right, just kind of enjoy whatever it is that comes out. here they, they can serve a really basic function they can just be kind of this thing that helps you bring you back into harmony as well by just playing a single note so um oh you're leaving sylvia okay well you um you just be careful remember what we said about face masks <laughs> just don't touch your face okay see you later see you later um so anyway one of the reasons why i bought this beautiful harp was because I wanted to just enjoy playing with a nice, I just wanted to enjoy plucking a string. <laughs> I didn't want to have to worry about the bow or anything, you know? And it's really hard, and that's, that's so far, I feel like it's very hard to sound bad on the harp. I'm gonna just take my bracelets off um, because it just sounds so beautiful no matter what note you're playing. So, does anyone else need their bow rehaired? Like my, my bows really need to be rehaired and my strings all need to be replaced. So my hair is getting split ends. <laughs> anyway, everything, everything's going a little crazy. But <clears throat> one of the reasons why I bought this is just I wanted to just use it almost like a, a music therapy instrument for myself to just enjoy hearing the sound of it. So I've had this harp for a week and um, I am gonna, I am gonna take lessons eventually. Um, there's actually a couple harp teachers on YouTube that I have reached out to, and I just love them so much. So um, I'm gonna definitely reach out to them and, and take some lessons. Right now, I'm playing everything with not the right technique, <laughs> um, but I've tuned it in C minor, so you can kind of hear. Them. tend to have a little more, I don't know, there's something about them that's just got a little bit more color, more something more interesting in some ways. It's more captivating to me at least. And so here's a little harp lesson for you. Can you see that there are red strings and then there's blue strings? So the red strings are all C. And here's another thing I learned is that um, on the harp you can see actually visually a representation of, I think it's Pythagoras's musical theory. <laughs> um, so anyway, you can see this C string is very, very long, but the next C string is half the length of that, forming an octave. The next C string is half the length of the previous one, or it's a quarter of the length of the first one, which is really interesting. And I think if you go up a fifth, um, I forget, there's some kind of ratio with that as well. The perfect fifth and the perfect fourth. There's some kind of ratio between, between those. Anyway, you can all read up on the ancient Greeks, um, Pythagoras' theory of music, um, music theory. <laughs> Um, but isn't that interesting? So a lot of medieval music and ancient music is really just made out of just a few simple notes. And um, one of the one of my favorite pieces is um, it's Cantiga 353 and Cantiga 100. And I, I don't have my music nearby. It's probably over there somewhere. Um, so I'm probably going to intertwine them. I'll probably accidentally play parts of one versus the other. Um, but I wanted to just show you, um, let's see. If I start here on this blue string, I don't know if you can see that. Since I'm tuned in the key of C minor, if I go up three strings, then I get to E major. 
So here's an E major scale. So if I, if I just start one string up, that's called the Dorian mode. And the Dorian mode for the ancient Greeks was very solemn and somber, but not necessarily sad. It just kind of puts you in a peaceful state. So listen to this. This would be called, because I'm starting on the note F, and I'm taking, um, which is the second scale degree of E major. I'm starting on the second scale degree of E major, which is what my harp is tuned in, or C minor, same thing. Um, it's called the Dorian mode. So this would be called the F Dorian mode. So listen to this. It's got like a nice, peaceful, relaxing feel. It's not the same like E major. Or C minor. The Dorian mode, in this case the F Dorian mode. <laughs> so the piece that I'm going to try and play for you today, I'm going to mess it up, but um, it's in the Dorian mode and so I'm going to just play it in the F Dorian mode. And it starts, it's kind of dancing around these two pillar notes the first scale degree F, and the fifth scale degree, which would be C in this case. Can you hear that fifth? Um, and then I think it jumps up to, because we're in the Dorian mode, the chords that I'm gonna use for this are taken from the F Dorian mode, which is what I'm in, but it's also gonna be taken from the original key, which would be E major, so, um, the fifth scale degree of E flat, one, two, three, four, five, is B flat. So I'm going to be also using the B flat chord. In music, you're using the one chord and five chord quite a lot for music. I mean, it like it's the foundation for a harm for a chord progression: the one chord, the five chord, the one chord, and then like sprinklings of all the other chords in between. So because this is nice and simple, I'm going to be doing my one chord, which is my F chord. And then I'm gonna be jumping up to B flat, which is the five of the major key, which is E flat. Although in this context, it's actually a fourth, I think. I'm pretty sure that's what I'm using. I might also be using this one, which would be C. This is in the F um, Dorian mode. C is the five as well. So anyway, let me just play, let me play it for you. I'm not very good at playing chords down here, so I'm gonna just play the root. <laughs> so I'm gonna just play my F. jump up to the B flat, which would be the five of E flat. To this piece and there's two chords <laughs> you have your first section which starts on the on um let's see starts on one to five and then it just comes down and then it does it again one to five and it just comes back down eventually So 
that melody is literally using like five notes basically between the first scale degree one which would be f and the fifth scale degree which would be c here one two three four five so um this melody and that's really typical for a lot of ancient music because it wasn't about having a crazy range um, like the viol like a lot of virtuosic violin music, it has like a really vast range, like all the very low, all the, to the very, very high um, pitches. But the like simple medieval music and ancient music, it had a much smaller range. And if you think about it, like as a human, if you sing, it's probably easier for you to stay within a few notes um, range rather than like having like two octaves range. So anyway, that's the first part of the piece. Now the second part of the piece starts on the fifth scale degree, which would be C. So it's exploring all of the notes that are kind of from five up. down to one. So there's just kind of two little parts to that. And I guess what I'm showing you is how simple it can be. You just have your two chords there and your melody is taken from your one and your five, at least in this example. And then there's all these little passing notes down to one. The next part of the melody is a little bit contrasting. It's exploring the fifth scale degree and up. eventually comes back to to the one <laughs> so anyway that is a that's one of the cantigas from medieval Spain which is pretty cool um, I haven't really been playing any Celtic mu music yet <laughs> although I am playing a Celtic harp and I am reading all about the Celts and you know various other I'm basically reading about Celtic and Irish and um, the British Isles mythology as well. So I'm reading all of it, but also about the history as well, which is very, very interesting. So one day I'd love to go explore, you know, Scotland and Ireland and England and the Isle of Man. And I've been lucky. I've been, you know, to, I've been around there before, but I've never like really known the history and been there and maybe like sought out specific places. So that will be fun to return there at some point and, you know, go visit these ancient sites and maybe bring my harp with me, which would be so cool. Or maybe bring my viola or violin, would be so cool. So let's see, there's a beautiful song called The Isle of, um, The Aaron Boat Song. Let's see if I can figure that out. Oh, that's in the door, yeah, that's in the Dorian mode. So if I start on an F here, let me try a little higher. I mean, um, the nice thing is if you know a little bit of music theory, <laughs> uh, 
then and you can kind of follow your ear it's just so fun to be able to play things so simply hey brian i am so happy to see you here <laughs> yay well um yeah so i'm gonna let me see maybe i've just popped this down for a little bit and i wanted to talk to you about some themes that came up in lessons today uh this week sorry and just kind of Maybe just talk to you about some of those things. Maybe they will be helpful for you. Maybe they came up in your practice this week too. But first, we, ha we haven't had a sip of tea yet. We have to have a sip of tea. Let's have a little sip of tea. Cheers, my dears. Ah, very nice. And you know what? Since I have been exploring the ancient Celts, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson <laughs> on what I have learned about the ancient Celts. So this is an interesting book. This is actually Celtic Myths and Legends, and it's by Charles Squire. It's really a fabulous book. It's very, very good. Um, but I read this one chapter like three times because I wasn't, I just could not keep track of who the Celts were. And um, so here's what I have gathered. So maybe you will learn a little bit with me. <laughs> so the, um, a lot of what we know about these people, apparently it dates back to um, the writings of Julius Caesar, because he um, he was basically his own war historian. He had to he wrote all about you know what he the whatever he gathered when he was doing battles with these various tribes, and so a lot of it comes from that from him. And um, I think a lot of the, the thing the reason is because these peoples didn't necessarily have. I'm not, I, I don't, maybe don't quote me on that. I was just going to say that I don't know that they really wrote a lot of stuff down. <laughs> Might have had more of like an oral tradition. I'm not really sure. But um, there are, there were two distinct races of peoples in the British Isles at the time of the Roman conquest, which is quite interesting. So I'm not really sure when the Romans were there. That probably would be helpful to know, wouldn't it? But maybe is that like the like the first century or something? I really don't know, it was a long time ago. And did you know there's actually an old Roman wall in England, it's called Hadrian's Wall. There's probably a few of them, but I think we've driven past that. <laughs> okay, why are we talking about this? It's just because I'm reading this and I have a Celtic harp right here. So we're gonna just quickly go over this. So there was kind of more of an Aboriginal type of people in the British Isles that um, were shorter, dark haired, and had dark eyes. And they may have been like, they were from the European like area, the European land mass originally, but they uh, over time like migrated to the British Isles and they kind of stayed, Britain was isolated from the European mainland. So a lot of the, the like developments that civilization made on the mainland really didn't happen or happened in a different way in the British Isles, apparently, many, many years ago. And so, um, anyway, do, do, do. when the Celts arrived, they this kind of Aboriginal people here in the British Isles still held um, and would continue to thrive in Southern Wales and in Ireland. Isn't that interesting? Michael, I'm reading about your, your you know, country's history. <laughs> So, um, and then, so they were there for a little while and then eventually the Celts started to, in, to like come into the British Isles and there was two distinct groups of Celts according to the Romans at the time that they were there. Um, the first group that entered the British Isles was called the Goidles. I'm probably pronouncing that right, wrong, but it came from the Gales. I don't know if you've ever heard of Gaelic or the Gales before, but they actually um, came from the land mass called Gaul, and the Gaul and the Romans did a lot of warfare together, I guess. There were three distinct tribes of, of people from Gaul, according to the Romans' writings. So there was the Belge, the... Aquitani and the Celte, also known as the Goidles or the Gales. And um, the Belge actually were the second group of people to come into the British Isles. They were a little bit more advanced in their civilization because they had stayed on the mainland Europe for a little bit longer, but interesting. So the Celts were like a taller, fair haired, blue hair, gray eyes, maybe like red haired kinds of people as well. So they kind of inhabited um, England after the, um, 
the gales came in. So interesting, if you do go to, to the British Isles, you're gonna see remnants of these old ancient, you know, tribes. Um, still Gaelic, still survives in the Isle of Man, parts of Ireland and Scotland and Wales. Um, so probably some other places. I don't know if you've heard of the Picts in like the northern part of the, of um, England, or was, is that Scotland? I don't know. I have to kind of, I'm just kind of learning. I know like a small little bit, but such interesting times such interesting times. So that was our history lesson. <laughs> but here are some thoughts on what I learned um, from my students this week. So everybody is kind of, there's a group of people that are kind of working on their setup. And then there's, so there's, we're talking about this thing, we're talking about this thing. And um, so let's just go over that really quickly. So I recently made a video on, on a recent video on how you can find your bow hand. Um, and you want to be kind of finding it like this and everything. But you can also, um, there's so many ways that you can find your bow hand. Um, I was going over this way with a few students this week too. So you can take your right hand and you just put it over like this. And you know, we have these little lines here in the, in the fingers. So if you line up this little part, this little gappy part here with the middle lines of your middle finger, just put them together like that. And then let the fingers spread out and then just let things flop there like this. You're gonna notice that the bow is kind of cradled in the fingers like this. Pinky goes on the tip there, and then the thumb's gonna just go on the side in this little gap here, okay? Make sure that you, once you let the bow kind of sit there, that you wrap your fingers around like this, like so. Take a look at the first finger. It's hitting it here. It's not hitting it there. It's hitting it right there and you're gonna spread your fingers out. There you go, not too much, but just kind of have a nice comfortable grip. Take a look at my wrist, right? If I turn it around, I've still got a nice curve there. Just if there was no bow there, I'd have a floppy wrist, still have a floppy wrist here, can still move it around, right? So now if I grip this and I wanna wave my bow around, I'm gonna wave it around from here, and this isn't gonna go anywhere, nowhere. <laughs> So then the next thing to do is, you know, to just find where your, where your instrument is. So if I just put my instrument over here because it's comfortable for my setup, my bow is not straight. I have to kind of move my arm around to keep it straight. So I'm gonna have to move my scroll this way, more in front of me like this. And once I do that, now my bow is just naturally straight. I don't have to worry about it. I can just open my arm and move normally. <laughs> works really well. So if you're struggling with your setup, you might just explore, you know, without your shoulder rest for a second to just find what that contact point is, like where the position is. Use a mirror and just watch where your arms are. Make sure that your arms are staying in front of you, you know, and when you put your bow up, is it just naturally straight or is it like this? And if you're not sure, just make sure that you can work with your first finger. Just have your first finger be the one that kind of touches all of the strings. And as you move first finger over, it's not your fingers that are moving, it's your arm. You see that little rotation there in the shoulder? That's gonna take my finger across. So my finger is just attached to this thing that's moving. So it's the same thing with the bow. Can you see that little rotation there? So anyway, that was one of the things that, that kind of came up. Um, another thing that came up was, and also another technical thing, was just finding first finger. You know, and we always need to know where first finger is because it's the foundation of all the other fingers, right? And we also need to be able to just move your, move the fingers around from this little um, axis point. I guess you could think of it as an axis point. Nice and comfortable, right? Not in the you know, the base of your hand here, but just sitting right about there. And then can you swing your arm open and close? So you could pivot around to the bottom string or you could pivot around to the top string, but your finger is not the one that's moving. No, <laughs> you want this to be moving you around. So when you find your first finger, it's just about finding where it drops. So let's say that I'm just putting my hand up here and I'm trying to find my first finger. 
This is obviously too high if I'm trying to be in first position. So I'm not gonna just move my finger back because that doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna open this whole thing and slide everything back and then practice dropping in my finger in a nice square like this. And then I'm gonna use my tuner to see if I'm sharp or flat or whatever. And I can also use my ear because I'm listening for do, re. I'm just listening for a whole step. Sounds like do, re, right? And then once I can find that, if I can just switch around between the strings, you know, like this, then I'm good. Then I can start to find the other fingers. And when you find the other fingers, it's nice to start with the basic hand pattern because that's the easiest pattern for all of your fingers, right? Okay, how to play a slide or a glissando. I see your, your message. I will try and remember that. Um, so when you find your fingers, you want to set your hand up so that all your fingers can sit there. So for example, this doesn't work. That means that for me to play my fourth finger at the last minute, I have to change my form. So I wanna make sure that I can put all my fingers down at whatever you know, my form is, and then I just have to lift them up. If I need to change strings, I just use my arm and open or close to whatever string I need to do, right? Same thing when you shift position. You gotta find where your first finger is and check it against the open string. Make sure that your interval that you're playing, if I'm in third position, here comes the rod, it's the perfect fourth there. Making sure that your open string and your first finger position are in tune and then the other fingers can come from there, if that makes any sense. Now how to do a glissando. All you have to do to do a glissando is you just keep your finger on the string and you're gonna slide. So let your bow do its thing. And your finger's just gonna slide up. You can kind of just play around with that. It's, it's kind of tricky because you're keeping your finger on the string, but you don't have a death grip on it. You're not squeezing. You're just, you've just dropped your finger and you're just keeping it, keeping it along for the ride. <laughs> so, and you know, just in general, when you're studying an instrument or when you're studying anything, the whole point is to have fun with it and to enjoy it. Yes, we're gonna learn something, but I think putting like a lots of pressure on yourself is, um, it just like, it doesn't really help the whole process. So it's that whole perspective as well, just reminding me, because I also struggle with that so much. I know we all do. And um, that was also like a, a kind of a theme that came up. I broke my left shoulder last time. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. There was two comments that came up at once and somebody said they they had an injury. I'm so sorry that happened. Maybe you can play the harp. It is so fun to play this thing. Grab a harp. <laughs> uh, maybe that would be a fun thing to play. You know, the other thing that I really love are singing bowls. Singing bowls are just amazing. I love, love, love playing singing bowls. Here's the singing bowl. This one right here. So yeah, just having fun. Just having fun with, with it and not putting too much pressure on yourself because it doesn't really help, does it? And there's this saying that girls just want to have fun. Channel that inner girl. <laughs> That just wants to have fun, you know? Anyways, you guys, I have a Zoom gathering to, to um, try to do this evening. It's gonna be a, it's a free Zoom gathering and it's for my, um, my students in my studio and it's for any of my patrons. So, um, Oh, please show basic fingering on the harp. I actually have no idea what the basic fingering is on the harp. I'm just, I'm just plucking <laughs> like this. Um, but on the harp, you have red strings and, and blue strings. And if you watch this backward back, you'll see that, um, you'll see kind of me talking about that. And that helps you to know what notes they are. And you can always tune them. There's levers for you to raise and lower. Um, so anyway, what was I saying? Oh yes, so um, I'm going to be doing a, a little get together this evening on Zoom for the studio and for my patrons, anybody who's interested. All the information is on Patreon. It's just patreon.com slash violin viola masterclass. It's just $1 to subscribe, you guys. And yeah, the harp is the piano without a keyboard, exactly. <laughs> and it also has to be tuned in, in one specific key. And then from there, you can kind of change things around a little bit too. So, um, anyways, I would love to see you there. I am learning how to use Zoom, so it's probably going to be a little shaky for me. Still, the first um, time that I did the Zoom gathering a couple weeks ago, 
I just had no idea how to handle a group on, and I think I'm probably gonna have to use a little bit different way of doing things. Um, but anyway, just send me, <laughs> send me good vibes for trying to figure out how to, how to do a group thing on Zoom because I think it would be so fun. This evening I'm gonna just be teaching a little section from our book one and our book two, I think. Um, so if you have the Hour Method books, you, and you can also attend and not play anything. Um, you don't have to, you can, when you join, you don't have to have your video, you know, come up. You can just have your picture or no picture come up. You can just kind of attend um, without really participating, but just kind of watching and listening. And it's just gonna be 30 minutes. It's just a practice for me because I really think that on Patreon, it would be an amazing way to just teach a lot of you in a cheaper way, because I know that um, paying for private lessons is not always something that's affordable for everybody. And um, I'm honestly so busy <laughs> as a teacher right now, and I'm very so grateful for that, but I'm just so busy that I, I just don't have any more space uh, at the moment. And so I'm just trying to think of ways that I can help and be there for those of you that want to study um, and either don't have the money to pay for lessons or it's because I just don't have any space right now. <laughs> so um, I was just thinking, once I get good at doing the Zoom, the Zoom thing, I think I'm gonna put a new tier on the Patreon and um, just kind of have a, you know, a little subscription for those of you that, that really just want the next level kind of um, stuff and, and want to meet for group classes via via Patreon, like once or twice a month or something to just help you along your musical studies. And I would just kind of go through them, you know, for like an hour, just like I normally do in a lesson. So we would, my, my vision is to do like a, a warm up like we do in lessons. We usually use, it just depends on where we are, you know, what the level is. We usually use the hour books, just a little small section from that to, to warm up the bow, warm up the left hand. Um, then we'll do a little shradiac or a scale or something, just nice and slow, kind of get to know things, feel things out. And then and then I can teach a little song from whatever, you know, book we're, we're using. Um, but I don't think, I think the, the thing is, is you would have to have your own copies of whatever the books are that we're working on. Um, so that's just my idea for the future and so stay tuned for that and if you're interested in it just go ahead and, and subscribe <laughs> to the Patreon right now. It's just one dollar to do that and you can cancel anytime. That way at least you can stay up to date with the things that are happening there and um, you know always just follow me here. You follow me on Instagram. You guys I, I, I try and post a little story there um, every day. I think I posted like one thing today. Um, but sometimes I, you know, take you on a walk with me around the neighborhood and thank you so much, Michael. Yay. Um, yeah. So sometimes I just take you around in my life. I'll, I'll show you what I'm wearing. I'll show you, you know, what I'm doing, how, what I'm teaching and just like a little glimpse into the life of a music teacher. And I just try to do that during, during the week or so. Um, I'm learning how to balance all this technology and how to balance social media versus my life <laughs> so um, I'm still feeling things out a little bit with that but I just I love interacting with you guys and it's so fun to just have this space to be together so anyways I hope that you have a wonderful day and um, during this time no matter what time you know while I've been reading about history we have gone as a human race we have gone through so many tumultuous times and there are always people during those times and countless people that we have no memory of because for whatever reason, they just, they weren't like the big figures in, in history, but just like people like you and I, who are just everyday people. Um, and they had to deal with whatever the situation was. And that you can, you literally can choose how you want to deal with whatever situation it is that you're in. And um, I, I have this little motto that girls want to have fun, you know, <laughs> and I know that that's like a frivolous motto, but I really do. Like every day I want to make sure that I had a good day and that um, what I what I did felt like it was good and it was in harmony and that things were lined up in my life and I was doing things like that I would be happy and proud of and feel good about and maybe helped whatever um, and to just have fun. So like we talked about this morning, or not this morning, but it, earlier in the video, 
just if you have some chaos in your life that's like e easy enough to clean up, just go look at that mess and just clean up that little mess and you can see that you actually can do that in this physical dimension. You can also do it in your inner world. You can do it in your outer world, uh, in your business world, in your personal life, in your all the various, various aspects of life. <laughs> and then you can make it beautiful. You could make it so insanely beautiful. So um, just don't discount those little things. It's those little things that make a really big difference, don't they? So anyways, I'm gonna love and leave you. I'm gonna grab a little sip of water. Let's see. Let's say bye with the harp. Let's see. <laughs> How about we, we leave with a lovely, peaceful Dorian mode scale? <laughs> okay, so I will see you guys on a Zoom tonight, possibly, if you are um, in the studio, oops, or if you're on Patreon and you want to join that. Otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday for the recorded videos I've been doing. I'll see you on Instagram. Join me on Instagram. It's all Violin Viola Masterclass. My website is Violin Viola Masterclass, and I will see you all very soon. So lots of love, and if you put a mask on, just put it on. Don't touch your face until you get home and wash your hands and then take it off and throw it away. And then you have to use a fresh one. That's the best way to keep healthy, okay? Mwah. See you soon, bye.